We are live. We are live. Hello. We did it. We did it. I just am setting up the screen so that, like, if I want to show pictures on screen, I can show pictures on screen. Oops. Seems like I changed your title. You did? Yeah. Because it, it was like IRL space exploration or something like that. Or... Sp I IRL oh. simulations, yeah, and I was just like, that doesn't make any sense. I called it simulating space missions. Okay, so you changed my name for the show, not my my title for like. Oh, I could do that too. You were yeah, well. That's why Uba. I was so confused because like, <laughs> I thought that was the one thing that yeah. I always consistently had right. I feel like I say the word science too much when I'm reading out the intro, so I'm changing it to. <laughs> To the chief analyst, chief. Let me see. See, my name is Professor Kane. I'm the publisher of University Day. With me is Dr. Pamela Gate, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of Cosmic Quest. So I say science twice. There's a little too much alliteration there. Really I know, bad and I enjoy grammar. it. Hmm. What about senior astronomer for the Planetary Science but that's Institute? That's not actually my title, and that could get me yelled at. Please don't get me yelled at. Okay. All right. I'm just since since changing your title is on the table, now I'm going to now I'm going to scheme. <laughs> uh so did you did you try to see the auroras at all? We have had so many clouds and I didn't yeah. have it in me to go driving to find a hole somewhere. Yeah, if you had like nice clear skies then it's worth doing, but yeah, yeah. have you managed to see anything i i heard your disappointment of, yeah. of the poking through the clouds but yeah so we we so the so the first night i think it was like the two i'm trying to think when it was it was last week mm -hmm. and we did our level best um we could see like and it was apparently it was a much more purpley color than the green so there's a lot of greens a lot of purples and reds like a very different looking aurora than than normal oh um, that's cool yeah and we could see we got we could get we took some photos of the horizon and we could get some of the purple and and red glowing around this giant cloud bank and we could see like a green glow coming through the haziness of the cloud so if it was clear skies, I'm sure we would have been able to see it. No problem. That is and so much it, sadness. Yeah. Yeah. And then we've just had storms and rain since then. So it's been, yeah, it was not, it was not great, but I mean, you just like, it just shows you like, like the storm. So the sun is acting up now is the time. Yeah. So, so be prepared, get a Aurora app, alert app on your phone, on your email, Mm -hmm. follow the websites bring yourself up to speed watch the sun see what's happening with the various activity and when you get these x class flares coming off the sun a day later this is your shot at, at seeing an aurora yeah and even like, people were seeing them really far south um oh where where are people seeing them definitely in montana definitely in colorado definitely okay. um so i would say like anywhere southern oregon and north and lots of places in Europe. So, and the sun is just getting more and more active. And, you know, we're yeah. seeing possibilities that's going to be outrageously active this solar season. So, so, so this, this has really got me thinking about like, we're launching all of these LEO things. There's the NASA investment in small sats from universities and stuff. And I feel like every mission is playing solar roulette yeah they were worried that in fact there was there was some worry that this latest storm was going to cause some some interruptions in communication systems things like that but yeah looks like it was fine but I, but like you know i talk about this all the time and i just like even if you don't live in in iceland or um or alaska you can see auroras yeah yeah but you have to be prepared for disappointment and so you have to understand like you have to go get like i said get an app get 
the kind of technology that allows you to just understand where Aurora sightings are possible. And yeah. then you've got to scout out some locations, a place that gives you a view to the north, to the horizon, to mm -hmm. the north. So if you can get to a lake that gives you a nice view to the north, if you can get to a series of planes, you also want dark skies. So you want yeah. as dark skies as you can get your hands on. Uh, and then you just want to be ready and wait. And then like many of the times you're not going to see them. You're going to go north. You're going to get to your dark skies. You're going to be looking on the horizon and you're not going to see anything. You're and going to drive and then, six hours. For you're going to no drive. Yeah, reason. exactly. Yeah, exactly. You're going to drive this time and you're not going to see anything. But that one time when you see it yeah. and the sky lights up and you see these flickering dancing auroras, it's life changing and and a, a fantastic use it's an adventure and yeah. yeah you could move to floor you could move to to iceland or fairbanks or northern canada and then you just look out the window in fact a lot of astrophotographers <laughs> in those places are annoyed by the amount of auroras yeah. that they get but which is um, hilarious yeah yeah i still you know i know i've been raving about it for years now but the ones that i saw about five years ago were life-changing they I've, i can't describe the beauty and excitement of seeing those auroras so uh everyone should be able to see a rocket launch everyone should be able to see an aurora yeah those those you should be able to bank we need the universe to throw comets at us and we you know you've got some travel and some expense to go and see a an eclipse have but. have you been to one of those hotels where they stick you essentially in a glass igloo so you can lie in no. bed watching auroras no that no that's view. on my bucket list yeah it's pretty great i was i was tempted to build one i, I may i may amazing. see if i can get my hands on one and build one of them because it does sound pretty great like to sleep out at night yeah. under the stars um is pretty great not be bitten by bugs yeah I mean, that's the day yeah. I mean, we could do we do that here we put a bed outside and then you just lay under the stars but you do get pretty bug bug bit by by morning so so i have i've spent stupid money on kickstarter on really awesome um tents that have the bug nets that you can actually see through fairly well mm, that's cool um so still not binoculars, but because of the way they're designed, if you want to have like bug neck except for your head, you can do that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Usually that's what you do. You just you just zip up so that you just yeah. your eyes are are looking out. <laughs> and uh, it's not bad. The bugs aren't that bad here in Canada where I live. The rest of the Canadians are like, are you crazy? The bugs will lift, will suck your blood dry and carry your desiccated corpse off to feed their children. But on the West Coast, it's not so bad. So I, I feel like summers. what we need to do is create an integrated system where there, there are stretchy uh, eyepiece holes and gloves embedded yeah. into the bug net so that you can hold your gloves and your binoculars and and the only way that the bugs can get in is when you pull the binoculars away from your eyeballs even then though it they yeah. i no so the my, bugs, my the bugs still my other plan is we have some busted up skylights from building our shop because the snow the tore yeah the skylight apart and yeah. so i was thinking of like building a like building a box and putting the skylight on like a hinge uh -huh. and then you just lie under the skylight and then you can just flip the skylight open, get under and then close it back down above you. Kind of like you're lying in a, in a, um, you know, coffin and then you've got the view of the sky. So well, that's my other idea. Like I used to have a Honda Accord where, where you could just slide back the sunroof, but mm. you have domes, don't you? Those don't slide so well. No, they're they're flat. They're flat topped. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'm trying to think if I can, you know I can use because I've got these extra, you know we're gonna have to throw them away. So if I'm gonna although the, the the maker wants them for scientific purposes to understand exactly how it was possible that snow could tear the skylight apart because he'd never seen it before. Um. All right. Let's all do right. Our show.
It's episode 367? Three, six, thirty-eight. Six. You got every number wrong. I hate having dyslexia. <laughs> Wait. Yeah, it was a, I mean, they're kind of mixed up and off by one, but that's okay. Well, the off by one is just because our website is apparently out of date. And but... you count from zero, like a good any good programmer should. Right. Right, and now the water pump's going. Okay, we're going to pause the water pump. I hate the water pump. Oh, yeah. I mean, the water pump in our trailer is right... I don't know if people have ever heard it, but it is right underneath where my computer is. Like, so I'm, I'm, I've got my computer sitting on, on a bed, and then the water pump is... The whole mechanism for the water pump, the water heater is all directly underneath, and it makes this rattling noise. Yeah, so our water pump is like eight feet that way, ten feet that way. And and it's the meter that makes most of the noise, honestly. Yeah. Is it still going? Someone's really, I bet someone's filling the teapot back up or the coffee mm. pot back up. Or having a shower. No, I know that's not happening. There. Okay. Okay. Awesome. I am pressing record. I am pressing record. All right. Um, we're ready to go. Here we go. Astronomy Cast, episode 638, Simulating Space Missions. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I am doing well. We, we are at that point in spring where the magnolias are in full bloom, the apple oh. tree is about to bloom, and that means yes. we will have one more snowstorm. Yeah, we have we have a snowstorm right now. So, and like in April, this is madness. Um, <laughs> so, so I was talking to one of my patrons today, and so an interesting thing people maybe don't know if you sign up as a patron for Universe Today, I do a uh, a, a phone call with you or a, a Zoom meeting with you to just get information about how you became a patron, how you found out about Universe Today, and how we can make things better, and so on. And I was talking to another person who says that they use our stuff for falling asleep. And I just I just want to say that's okay. We understand. We appreciate the fact that we're able to play this really valuable role in everybody's lives in helping them go to sleep. It's and, it's true. I do listen yeah. to other people's podcasts. Me too. To go to sleep. To sleep. Yes. So <sighs> so we understand. We do it too. It's totally fine. Don't feel guilty. Yeah. Uh, if we can bring that valuable role, if our, if our soothing monotone voice can make you feel like you have to go to sleep, that's perfect. I, I just, I, I think it's our soothing, not entirely monotone voices that are putting people to sleep. <laughs> yeah. It ties up the thinky part of the brain. Yeah. Although humans have never actually been to Mars, explorers have simply many aspects of Mars missions here on Earth. There are missions under the ocean, on the tops of volcanoes, in the harsh Canadian north, and even in bed that simulate the limitations of spaceflight and teach us many of the lessons to prepare us for the real thing. And we'll talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. So have you ever done one of these simulated Mars missions? No, they they require you to put the rest of your life on hold for for longer than I've ever felt that I could get away with, given all the different things that I'm constantly doing. Basically, I I like to multitask, and if you're yeah. doing one of these things, you have to be completely committed. And and the other part is that like. The Mars ones they do in Hawaii, I have yeah. a severe sulfa allergy that when... Mm, um, the VOG. Of, yeah, VOG makes me think that I have pneumonia and it's just allergies. Yeah. 
So. Well, and sulfurish, sulfuric clouds going into your lungs. All right. So let, let's put this idea. So I guess how, what are some examples of simulations that are done to help us understand spaceflight? How does this work? They, they're trying to test lots of different things, ranging from uh, how does the human body respond to not having a di diurnal cycle with the sunrise and sunset? How does the human body respond to not being allowed to be vertical in a gravity well? How do human beings deal with being stuck in a small container they can't escape? And, yeah. and to test each of these different things, including technology tests of how do we handle it when, I mean, as kids, we all played the floor as lava. Well, they instead go out into northern Arizona and play the air as vacuum. And, and with each of these different experiments, they're looking to understand the human psyche or the physiological response to these different not normal environments yeah yeah i mean there's so many the communication delays the checklist of procedures that you have to go through to go in and out of your spacecraft and so on yeah. and i mean there's a very rich heritage of this the apollo astronauts simulated their missions yeah in the deserts here on earth as well and, and some of it is to simulate to get used to things and to test out things. Desert Rats is uh, building on the legacy of what the Apollo astronauts did out in the North American deserts because they are sending out astronauts who are going to be asked to collect geological samples while wearing these bulky, terrible suits that have been adjusted so that they don't weigh as much, but it's the equivalent of what they're gonna be dealing with in terms of my hands are stuck in gloves. Yeah. And the poor astronauts couldn't bend at the waist. And just trying to figure out how to do anything when you know if you fall over, you're going to be a landed turtle. You have to practice that. You have to practice the, okay, how does, how does my spacewalk buddy get me back up when I fall on my back? Yeah. Um, and, and all the awkwardness of outer space. We, we think of the glory, the overview effect, the, the amazing... I get to eat that water bottle that is hanging out in the capsule, the water bubble in the capsule. We forget the, that rock is really far away because I can't bend over problems of space yeah. flight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, astronauts fell over several times. Uh, there's even some hilarious video of them, of this happening to them. So let's talk about some of these, these missions. Uh, pick you you mentioned desert rats yes. so give us an example of, of so what is desert rats so desert rats is a, a program that has taken various uh concept models for lunar rovers and spacesuits and tested them out in northern arizona and what's cool is they've done things like we know that moon rock is is like finely ground up into regolith is like wearing glass in your clothing. So you, we want mm. to do absolutely everything possible to mitigate the potential of getting space dust into the human areas. And so they've been doing cool testing of things like rovers that drive along with these bodies mounted to the outside, except they're just the spacesuits. And the astronauts yeah. slide into the spacesuits, a door gets closed onto their back, and they're good to go. And, yeah. and this is a super clever new design, but you have to figure out the logistics of can human beings handle getting in and out where you're essentially docking your back up at the end of the spacewalk. And, and so they're testing different designs, they're testing different, uh, like I said, concept models for the lunar rovers. Uh, and this gives them a much cheaper place to test these prototypes and figure out the, 
design elements that really matter if, if we want to have more than a couple of weeks at a time up in space. And you can imagine, like, like when you think about something that you know how to do really well, like, yeah. I don't know, get into your car and drive it. And then if you really like sit down and think about all, all of the different parts that you have to do, you have to open the door, unlock the car, open yeah. the door, get in, sit down, adjust the seat, um, uh, maybe adjust the steering wheel, start the car, operate the car. And then imagine you're wearing a spacesuit this entire time while you're doing this. Yeah. You don't want to be on the moon or on Mars the first time that you've tried all this stuff out. You want to be incredibly comfortable. And the engineers want to have gone through every action, every motion that you're doing to try to minimize mistakes and yeah. parts where you can accidentally press the wrong button at the wrong time. And so there's a lot of design issues. And it's through trial and error that you find this stuff, ideally, in a, in a really safe environment. Yeah. All right, we're going to talk about this some more in a second, but it's time for another break. All right, so you talked about desert rats, and, and I think that's a, the kind of simulation that a lot of people are very familiar with. But there yeah. are some really interesting simulations that, say, the Mars Society is doing, NASA is doing, where people take their simulation of Mars to the next level. And, and the simulation of Mars from the next level, we have people going from roving around in northern Arizona to instead purchasing, per wow, mispronounced that word, to instead perching on the tops of volcanoes on the big island of Hawaii. And in this lava strewn landscape where things really are sharp, it's not just a let's go out and drive around for a while and test the feasibility of getting in and out. There is also the, okay, we're going to have everyone live off of solar electricity in a dome where we have airlocks that you have to deal with. And the entire thing becomes a, I could die, by which I mean ejected from the simulation. Right. Um, up on this world and and here they actually do fairly regularly look for volunteers for this simulation and they even they'll put in like the time delay between yeah. earth and and mars the round trip time delay and so you can't just ask for help you can't have a conversation with you have to send messages and then you have to wait 40 minutes between 15 and 40 minutes for your for a reply to come back from earth um yeah. the the you know just this that causes an enormous amount of complexity and difficulty because you're you really are on your own um i was i've talked to someone who was was in one of these these simulations and they really get serious like they're really larping it to mm -hmm. the next level that is the right way to put it yeah yeah they're larping being doing a mission to mars yeah and for if you don't know what larp is the live, live action, action role playing yeah. yeah and and so then when things go wrong they do their best to try to make it work and mm -hmm. i you know they've had problems with their toilets they've had problems with their water system they ran out of water and they had to figure out to get water into the into the simulation and that just makes things even more complicated while you're going outside you're putting on this stupid spacesuit going out into the blazing sun of the volcano navigating around sharp lava rock trying to just get this this work done uh it's really the closest we can do to actually being on mars so far and the psychological side of this is something that really has to be understood I think that prior to COVID, we didn't really have a good understanding how the regular human being would react when asked to stay in one confined space in isolation or with the exact same group of people for a long period of time. And if nothing else, COVID has taught us that a lot of people really, really 
don't deal well with spending months at a time never leaving their house. Yeah. Turns out I'm one of those people who's pretty good at it. Yeah. Not sure what that says <laughs> about me. me. Yeah, not me. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I'd be fine clearly... going to Mars. <gasps> yeah. But the interpersonal reactions. Kim Stanley Robinson in his Red Mars series makes the fascinating point that the number of human reactions within a, interactions within a group goes up as um, an exclamation mark, which is that mathematical mm. thing. And factorial. That means, yeah, which, which means factorial. And it means that it's, say you have four people, the number of interactions is one times two times three times four. And that's a lot of human interactions. And if even just one of those doesn't work, it can destroy all of those interactions. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, we definitely have lots of experience. I mean, there are, there's missions down in Antarctica. There are yeah. submarine missions where people are under pressure and they in fairly enclosed places. I mean, I think Antarctica is is probably the best practical simulation yes. of this that we have because for six months of the year they are inaccessible like there's it's almost impossible to to deliver them any supplies to rescue people if there's some kind of medical emergency they are on their own yeah for half of the year yeah. and yet people are there all year all year long yeah and just imagine all of the ways that things go wrong not to mention people getting on each other's nerves which they can do um, and, yeah yeah and we've learned a lot about the way humans interact but in all of the examples that we've talked about now and i i think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the biosphere one and two experiments so let's talk about that yeah so so in in this case there was an attempt made again in the arizona desert yeah. to build a fully include enclosed biosystem that would be receiving no air from the outside and folks would be required to do all of their own gardening, all of their own everything. There were some technological problems that they ran into specifically, and this is the most ridiculous, huh, that I have, yeah. I have come across. It turns out that cement interacts yes. with atmosphere while it is curing and while your cement may be solid that doesn't mean it's fully cured and they mm -hmm. ran into problems with just their building materials destroying their atmosphere on them it was releasing carbon dioxide excess yeah. carbon dioxide that they hadn't accounted for in their simulations yeah yeah so biosphere one is earth and so yes. there, there biosphere two is the is the simulated habitat i I mean, I'm obsessed about Biosphere 2. I can't, I cannot describe how much of an amazing idea that was. And they got a ton, like a ton of flack about what they were doing. People were eye rolling, people were making fun yeah. of it. But, but it allowed them to essentially create a completely enclosed environment yeah. and then sort out every single one of the variables that human, you know, you figure out which thing human beings run out of. Do we run out of water? Do we have too much carbon dioxide? Are we, you know, various nutrients? And if they were able to con continue running the simulation, we would just learn more and more. And it just shows you how much the earth is doing naturally for us year after year after year, completely self-regulating that we just take completely for granted. Yes. I, I can't believe that, that Biosphere 2 wasn't, restored immediately and is an ongoing up. Apparently it's, it might be coming back, but right now it's just kind of a tourist attraction. It's an educational facility. It gets lots Maybe. of grant money to do educational stuff. Yeah. Restart Biosphere 2, make it happen. We, we can't have a colony on Mars until Biosphere can run for decades yeah. safely and successfully. So yeah, if you're into space exploration, all right, uh, man, I just, I am on such a soapbox here. All right, we got, we'll talk about this more in a second, but it's time for another break. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the idea of bed rest. Oh, this, this is wild. So all, all the experiments we've talked about so far are ones where you still have gravity, you still have a day-night cycle, um, 
And it turns out that gravity in a day-night cycle are things that really matter. And one of the things that they've had to figure out is what is the physiological issue with never having gravity draining the fluid out of like face and things like that. <laughs> And so they will look for volunteers periodically to hang out at Johnson Space Center, laying in bed for weeks or months. And yeah. they're required, while maintaining a horizontal position, to go through various things like exercising. And there's, I couldn't find a picture that, that I could readily share, but there have been posts before of people like precariously figuring out how to roll over just right so they can put food into their mouth without wearing it. Um, it's, it's apparently a combination of remarkably difficult to actually keep yourself horizontal all the time. And you have to. Yeah. Yeah. You can't get up and go to the bathroom. You can like just yeah. think about that for a little while yeah you have to eat entertainment everything in this prone position for weeks or months at a time people can come visit you yeah but but it it starts out as a i'm just gonna catch up on all my reading and playing video games and watching television and it will be great yeah <sighs> And, and then the, you know, exercising on this particular schedule while having to stay laying down while exercising is a bad thing. And, and so apparently everyone, like, eventually falls prey to the boredom and tedium, but they get the medical data they need. Yeah. Yeah. And, and a lot of this stuff that we've learned about spaceflight, again, came from these bed rest experiments yeah. done in the past. They do them in Europe as well. Yes. And... Um, and it's been invaluable. And then and, you can map and then you see what happens in spaceflight and you can see how, how the just is a, it's a perfect analog and it helps us try different treatments to see if anything, as you say, exercise, um, you know, there's this, uh, these potential uh, negative pressure sleeping bags they're considered to solve this problem. So, so it's so much easier to try experiments, take blood tests, here on earth have been out in space and so whenever we can simulate this stuff here on the planet they do so there's one one last simulation that i'd like to talk about and this is more short term if you're willing to simulate space flight for about 30 seconds at a time and these are these parabolic flights AKA oh yeah the vomit comet yeah yeah so so this we've talked about this before um I, I have to admit, I didn't even think about them for this episode. I had yeah. two other things to bring up. Um, okay. With these, it, it's you have an airplane, it climbs, 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 and then puts itself through free fall. And during the free fall point, you are experiencing, uh, basically, you are falling at the same rate that gravity is pulling, and it, it is a simulation of a zero-gravity experience, and astronauts can practice and students and tourists can practice uh, various different things that they'd want to do in zero G. And this has included various dancers trying to figure out how you can do new forms of dance in zero gravity. It's really quite fascinating. But again, it's like 30 seconds at a time. You puke yeah. a lot and move on with your day. Yeah, yeah. But there are various... Um chemical processes that have been tested yeah you can do tests of various you know how various mechanical systems are going to work in in zero gravity etc so yeah. it does work briefly you had you said you had a couple of other things that i we i did to? so one of my my favorite sets of experiments that that i've been tracking kind of since high school is there have been over the decades experiments where they lock people in caves for prolonged periods of time. And in many of the experiments, they don't give them any time devices. And they see how human beings 
deal with having absolutely no day night cycle that is externally enforced on them. Right. Uh, more recently, there was a French experiment where they put 40 people in a cave together for 90 days. <gasps> in yeah. total darkness? In or? total dark. It was, well, it was darkness when. It, it had artificial light, and that was right, it. Right, but they didn't know when it was day and when it was night. Yeah. yeah. And they could totally mess with their perception of time. And, and it turns out that a lot of people, not all people, but a lot of people will cycle to having a shorter day-night cycle. Um, mm. I know I, I am one, as I learned as an observational astronomer, who will cycle to a longer day-night cycle. But understanding that there is no one way that people react to lack of diurnal cycle and seeing how it affects mental health um it's it's fascinating and then you see these poor humans coming out of having lived in only small bits of artificial light for 90 days and they're all like sunglasses and looking yeah. up and it's it's like out of a movie where people are emerging from the nuclear shelters and it's it's cool work and and along similar lines but um a little bit harder to rescue folks uh if you have a panic attack in a cave you just shove them out the cave but there is also the the nasa nemo set session uh yeah. submersible where yes. they do long duration uh let's stick astronauts in this habitat underwater allow them to go on evas and scuba suits that feel like uh, space suits and so that's another way of simulating missions where you don't have that external day night cycle yeah yeah i i i find i, I mentioned that in, in the introduction but that's exactly it that that underwater is a surprisingly good way to test out all of the complexities of doing yeah. EVAs of, of going outside your space, spacewalking and, and these underwater facilities allow them to do that. So it's, it is kind of amazing that how much of the various concepts in spaceflight have already been tested out, whether it's in Antarctica, whether it's under the ocean, whether it's on these, these Mars simulations mm -hmm. in beds, et cetera, et cetera, in zero G flights, like every aspect that we can simulate, we do and, and really should. And it will only be until we've mastered all the parts that we can before we go to try and live on the moon or Mars. And then we'll find out all the stuff that missed our, you know, missed in our simulations. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Thank you, and Pamela. Thank you so much, Fraser. Definitely and Thank you so much to all the people that support. I'm sorry, you're going to have to edit this. Uh, Rich, I, I do not have names. I now have names. Okay. It's the first recording of the month. And I think, why won't you open? Please open. We are delayed today because my mouse is just not happy and it does not want to open this file. Why, why won't you open the file? Come on. Let's read Load the page. I have never, there we go. All right, let's try this again. So thank you, Fraser, and thank you so much to everyone out there who makes this show possible. Your, your patronage over at patreon.com slash astronomycast allows us to pay all the people who organize the two of us. Nancy, who has been there forever as our cat herder, uh, Rich and Allie who do editing, and all the other humans who I'm sure I am forgetting at this particular moment in time. Um, this week, I would like to thank by name um, just a few of our Patreon followers. This week, I am thanking Thomas Sebstrup, uh, Stephen Veit, Burry Gowan, Mountain Goat, Gordon Young, Kevin Lyle, Jeanette Wink, Andrew Palestra, Brian Cagle, Venkatash Chari, 
David Trogue, the giant nothing, Aurora Leiper, David, Gerhard Schweitzer, Will Hamilton, J.F. Rougette, uh, Kako Sarif, William E. Krauss, Laura Kettleson, Robert Plasma, Les Howard, Jack Mudge, Joe Holstein, jo Gordon Dewis, Olga Bjorkog, Frank Tippin, Richard Drum, Neuter Dude, Alexis, Adam Anise Brown, William Backer, Wanderer M101, Zero Chill, William Andrews, Gold, Andy Cowley, Jeff Collins, Kellyanne and David Parker, Jeremy Kerwin, uh, Rob Cuff, Harold Bardenhagen, Philip Walker, Marco Orasi, Alex Cohen, David Gates, Nikki Lynch, Matthew Hostman, Rando, and Brian P. Cox. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And if you would like to hear me attempt to pronounce your name at the end of Astronomy Cast, uh, go become part of our community and get even more information by joining at patreon.com slash astronomycast. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Pamela. And we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye, everyone. Can you hear the rain here on my on my? No, but I'm wearing audio? really bad headphones mm, because okay, it okay. turns out my only wired headphones that fit with my extender are not that great. I, I buy, I buy uh, earbuds like in bulk. <laughs> so when there's like a good deal on say Amazon or something on like uh, ear candies, I'll just buy like four of them because, and then just stick them in the closet because I, yeah. I tear them up. I go through them like crazy. So the issue I ran into is I'm using a Mac pro, like one of those giant rectangles and to physically plug into it, my headphones have to reach across my desk, under my desk and into the hole under under the desk yeah so i have an extender right and the extender only works with headphones that that with two stripes trying to find headphones oh with only two stripes right I because they all they all want to have three stripes they want to have that little microphone or, right. or whatever right. yeah interesting Lindsay, tiny intern, went, I don't know how many different places. She's saying four. Went four different places before she finally found some with two stripes. Right. And they and they tend to have to be lower quality, less interesting ones. Yeah. You need yeah. a you need a better extender. Just Amazon. Yes. That will cost more money. They're like five dollars, but um, all right. So hit us with your question. Five dollars is the one with two stripes. Right, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's how this started. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, all right. So hit us with your questions, if you if and you have them. Uh, Hal McKinney asks, how might intelligent life mark time if there weren't days to mark time by? I well, it's your sleep. Your, so so the people outside monitoring everything, they're counting the time and they know no, no, they're no. going to pull the people out at 80 days. No, no, no. Or but, 40 but, days. but how's asking like what how would life evolve if there was no day night cycle? Like imagine a tidally locked planet where it was always daytime going around a star or just look inside caves there's all those really white no eyeball critters that live in caves yeah. and it turns out that a lot of life just has natural sleep wake cycles hmm and then i wonder but even they have ancestors that evolved well we don't know if proper... all the stuff living in caves does Sure, but like when you've got like fish or yeah, yeah, they all salamanders or things like that, they probably had an ancestor, and so those genes are in there somewhere. But imagine like a life form that evolved on a on a planet that's tidally locked to its star, and just the concept of day and night has just never existed. I, I suspect it would have to do with something like eating. You wake up, you hunt, you sleep. You wake up, you hunt, you sleep. Yeah. 
Yeah, like it may be tied to your to your digestion, yeah. or um, or or yeah, it's weird. Or you know, maybe if there's some kind of seasonality, even the but yeah, like the sun would just sit there day after day after day, and and you would just time would have no meaning. Like it, we don't think about how much day night plays a role in our yeah. in our lives, but it really does not to mention the year and the and the yeah it's kind of amazing and just the seasons and all that time is has such a meaningful impact your dog okay yeah my dog is fine broken symmetry over on twitch just typed my feet have slipped on the pedals of my sleep cycle and i'm rolling downhill and i just <laughs> feel that so deeply <laughs> yeah yeah that's awesome that one's getting um, screen captured. Arjun says, later. do they do any simulations of gravity? Like, will the suit survive a fall? What is the best way to move quickly? So there were simulations of gravity done mm -hmm. back in the 1960s when they were starting to figure out, like, what space flight going to be like. And they had these giant rings that would sit on the ground and they would spin around, sort of imagine like a Ferris wheel. A counterweight wheel, but on and a capsule. Right, no, no, they no, they, they have this giant Ferris wheel. Oh, those, and yeah. then and then the and then the astronaut would stand on the Ferris wheel, and then they would be in a suit that would be hanging them sideways, and would essentially make them weightless compared to the to the ground, and then they would spin up the they would spin up this wheel. So they would be getting this this centripetal force that was pushing them against the the floor of this Ferris wheel. And so they kind of were able to simulate the lower gravity, lunar gravity. And and then they tried to figure out how they would work with pieces of paper or moving things around. And and they found some really interesting stuff about how um like in that low gravity even like walking around is really tough because yeah. you kick off from the ground when you try to take a step that that it's walk like a penguin you, you knock over your cup you yeah. like you don't realize how little how much we're depending on the force of gravity all of the time so that's kind of the closest but the other thing that they really learned was that because not actually artificial gravity that it's it is you're getting it from this spin you get this coriolis effect and so what they found is they is that they you know if you want to pour liquid into a jug of water yes you have to do it at an angle because the water is going to fall back towards towards your towards yeah. your glass or if you want to drop something down it's going to fall at a at a slope and so unfortunately they also taught the astronaut how to how to predict the Coriolis effect that comes with the simulated gravity but but it shows that when we do kind of move to space and actually start building some kind of rotational thing to provide artificial gravity yeah you're now going to have this force that's going to be pushing you down but your brain is going to have to completely learn how motion works yeah. because you've got this you know if i want to throw a ball to you it is not going to work like zero gravity and is not going to work like regular gravity it's going to take this weird shape as it goes. So some experiments have been done, more need to be done, and they probably have to be done in space. Yeah. But it's really interesting. Ben Kalo asks, thoughts on crashing an asteroid into Mars to make a deep crater to live in, higher pressure, warmer, safer? Credit no, to please. Cody's lab for the idea. <laughs> I, I, I am generally against uh, doing significant harm to worlds until we have fully determined with certainty that they do not have life. Yeah, and there are places that are that are the bottom down of at the bottom. Marinaris. Yeah, the bottom of Mariners. Yeah, and there's, I mean, there even could be water down there in, you know, an ice. The pressure is like a little bit higher. You're protected from a lot of the space yeah. radiation if you hole up in a in like a really tall walled valley. You should be fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, 
uh, this question might be beyond our pay grade. Hal McKinney asks, how do we know proton synthesis isn't simply when particle pairs producing quantum foam do not always reannihilate? Yeah, above pay grade. Above our pay grade. Yep. You're an astronomer. I'm a journalist. Neither of us are particle physicists. Do, does gravity affect shape of magnetic field lines? Um, this is another question from Hal McKinney. This is going to be the Hal McKinney show. Come on, everybody. Yeah, Jump I in have no idea. Just... Huh. Okay, and... so what about like with frame dragging? Yeah, does that's frame... why I don't know. Yeah. Does because frame dragging... space time is being warped, so that should warp the magnetic field, but I don't want to say yes since I don't know. Yeah. Uh, because it affects radiation. So frame dragging is the gravitational analog of the magnetic field produced by an electric current or a moving charge. Whoa. That just blew my mind. This is from uh, Washington.edu. So that's kind of an interesting idea that that when you rotate an electric field, you generate a magnetic field. And frame dragging is the equivalent of you rotating a gravity, gravity. a yeah. gravity field. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, so we don't know the answer. Apologies. It's okay to not know things. This is why we science. It's so we can learn more things. Yeah. I'm looking, I'm seeing an answer on stock on stack exchange, but I don't understand it. <laughs> um, huh. Interesting. Okay. Arjun asks, would a spinning simulator in space that could do gravities at once be useful? hundred percent. Yeah. 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 Mars gravity, moon gravity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like right now the plan is wing it. Like go to Mars and we're just going to wing it. But, but you are six months of away from rescue resupply in a world that we don't understand how to live engineering. You're completely 100% dependent on every aspect of your technology, just like biosphere two. Yeah. The more we can simulate that experience, the better. And so like, that's why, like, it really feels to me like, like Elon Musk's plans, other people's plans. Like we're just going to go colonize. We're going to build a city on Mars. We're going to go colonize that place. Let's go. I mean, we're yeah. four years away from going to Mars. That's how you get Jamestown. <laughs> well, at least it's, it's how you get, uh, you get a disaster and a lot of people dying because of some really preventable thing that you could have learned about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've reached the end of our hour. Uh, Pamela, what are you working on? What are you doing? Um, I am finishing up writing a book with a couple of my friends. It's just a kid's book, but it's all about the moon. And uh, hopefully we will have a book to have in our hands by the end of summer to show all of you out there. And uh, beyond that, we have the Daily Space coming at you same time as Astronomy Cast over on twitch.tv slash CosmoQuest uh, Tuesday through Friday. So come check it out. Very cool. Uh, I've got my live show happening later on today, and we've got uh, more activity going on in our Discord server. Finally resurrecting my Discord server. So we're going to do one of these spaces i forget what they're called but it's like um you can do those live conversations yeah. and we do that on discord this week. we've got a bunch of topics planned one per week so you should definitely come and check out the discord server just do a search for universe today discord sounds sure awesome do that. Yeah, yeah all right well thank you pamela uh thank you everyone for watching us both on youtube and on twitch thanks to all the moderators thanks to the editors the of uh, organizers, the marketers, everybody who works with us to bring this production every week. Yeah. We couldn't do it with, without all of you. All right. We'll see you all next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone. 
Ah, uh, I forgot the button to transition awkwardness. There's and... a button. Press the.